Hey, power people. Welcome to Renewable Rides. I'm Gareth Evans. And I'm Dan Roberts. We're the founding team of Vecta, a platform and marketplace streamlining how companies buy on-site energy. In each episode, we'll uncover the latest trends, challenges, and triumphs relating to the energy transition through the experiences of our team and our inspiring guests. Our goal is to help companies take action to create a resilient, profitable, sustainable, and thriving energy future. Let's go. Hey, power people, and welcome back to another episode of Renewable Rides. And as a follow-on to our pain point series, today we're going to jump into a really crucial topic around how do we actually finance our energy projects. We're going to explore the financing options based on whether we want to own the system ourselves or whether we want someone else to own it for us. And by the end of the episode, we'll all have a clear understanding of the benefits, risks, and key considerations for each option, helping us make really informed and quality decisions for our business. But before we do, Dan, how's things? Doing quite well. As as you well know, uh, it was a fun day yesterday in, in the Roberts household. We finally got uh, this very large eucalyptus tree that's on the backside of our property. It's not on our property, it's in the in our community, um, but a very large eucalyptus tree that was both a, a fire concern for me because we've got a big canyon behind us that uh, we've had, not in our canyon, but in, in adjacent canyons, we've had some little wildfires and uh, and also just really opened up our view. So after a year of, of trying to convince the HOA to, to trim it for me, uh, we finally had a crew out yesterday trimming it down and uh it's quite nice and and the boys can't stop talking about it how about yourself that's awesome um wildfire risk mitigation key and as a benefit you get a view love it um yep. i'm super stoked this weekend i'm going to vcon for anyone that isn't aware of it gary vaynerchuk released um some nfts three or four years ago when it was really hyped up and uh, i wanted to explore what the world of NFTs look like, how you buy them, how you use them. And this one particularly interested me because it was a byproduct of getting access to his conference for the first three years and no one else that doesn't have an NFT doesn't get access. So super excited. It's all about um, bringing together pop culture, marketing, industry trends, latest innovation and um, and exciting technologies under one roof. And so it's in LA this year, so super convenient. So I'll uh, I'll let you know how it goes in the next episode. Eager to hear, uh, eager to hear the results and and the notes and and uh, see how we can apply some of the learnings. Yeah, love it. Um, for those that are interested, my NFT is the modest moose. So Gary uh, ended up creating a bunch of different characters to represent the values we should all live by. And so my son really wanted the patient panda. It's his favorite animal but it was too expensive. <laughs> so I went for the modest moose to uh, tie to Mel's Canadian background. So uh, it's fun. And I'll maybe post a picture of it with some some notes. Cool. Nice. So let's jump in. Dan, we're recording this episode, August 2024, and uh, inflationary pressures and market dynamics couldn't be more complex. Um, as business leaders, we're all experiencing increasing labor costs, raw material prices going up, the cost of capital increasing. And then to top all this off, a previously fairly consistent, predictable energy cost profile for our businesses um, has been escalating at 3 to 4% a year, is now escalating in very volatile and unpredictable ways. And we've talked about this at length and the reasons behind that. But I think the key question that we keep getting from our customers and people in our network is, I want to really take advantage of these on-site energy systems, but I don't know what my financing options are. And so we're going to dig into that today. And I think before we do, there's several key questions that as business leaders, we need to be asking ourselves to really understand um, what financing mechanism is best for me. The first is, do I actually even own my facility or property? Because this has a massive implication on whether we'd want to put money into it or not. And if we don't, and if we lease it, then it's important for us to get the property owner involved early. And I think, you know, as we discussed in our last pain point episode about engaging stakeholders early, this isn't one we covered, but definitely making sure that we get the, the property owner involved. Do we have a tax burden that we want to offset? Um, this is a huge one because there are massive tax opportunities in the market today. And we want to be able to determine which ones do we qualify for and which grants and incentives are really going to help um, me in terms of financing this system. 
do I have the cash to invest in an asset? And if not, do I have the right balance sheet or um, operating experience and expertise to demonstrate that I am a financially viable company for someone else to invest in, in me and my project? And then what is my company's financing strategy? Do we invest in assets? Are we asset light? Do, you know, do we want to put money to work? What is our return on investment, IRR targets? So all of these play into um, the different decisions we can make around the, the financing of these systems. But regardless of the structure we choose, the motions around the planning, the engineering, the permit, the interconnection, the construction, the commissioning, and even the energizing of these systems are largely the same. And so we've talked about this in the other pain point episodes, number 43, 47, and 49. How do we develop the strategy? How do we configure the right system? And then how do we actually engage the right stakeholders in our organization to get these projects going? So definitely check them out. But Dan, you're going to talk us through what are the three primary paths to financing our energy systems? Yeah. So as far as uh, if the path is is better for you to own the system, and, and as I get into it, it'll be become more clear. There's really three primary paths, self-financing a system, debt financing a system, and a capital lease. And so as we, we get further into that, I'll, I want to start with that ownership is really a both a financing and a tax driven concept. And when you when you own the energy system, you're able to reap the tax benefits, such as the the federal uh, investment tax credit or the ITC, as well as other uh, financing uh, mechanisms like accelerated depreciation. Uh, if you if you if you don't uh, want to take advantage of those, there's others that that you'll get into here shortly, Gareth. Um, and when I talk about tax credits, I want to be very clear that these are dollar for dollar tax credits, not a tax write off. And so if you have, say, a million dollars of tax burden in a, in a particular year and you build a two million dollar project in that year, you're going to have roughly six hundred thousand dollars or potentially more of tax credits because the, the tax credit is at 30 percent. I'll get into more of that in a second. But you have six hundred thousand dollars worth of tax credits that can offset that million dollars of tax burden. Therefore, you only have another four hundred thousand dollars of taxes to pay. So it's it's much more valuable than than, say, a write off. And this is really important because if you have that tax burden and you want to offset it, this uh, owning the system is is your pathway to doing so. Now, I'll also mention that just because you have a tax burden uh, and just because you have a very strong cash position doesn't mean that, that owning the system is right for you. There's many examples uh, out there, Walmart being a great one, where, where they have a huge tax burden, they have a great cash position, but they still actually go out and use the energy as a service or, or power purchase agreement pathway for their own reasons. And, and, and again, we'll, we'll touch on some of those here shortly. But from uh, starting off with, with the self-financing with your own uh, cash off your own balance sheet, uh, some of the benefits are there's tons of incentives available in the market. Um, the, the, the largest of which, which I've, I've touched on, is within the Inflation Reduction Act, the tax credits. And you get to utilize the full 30% tax credit. Uh, now, the there's adders that, that you may qualify for as well. And, and uh, the Vecta platform helps companies with large portfolios identify which uh, uh, facilities are eligible for some of these adders, specifically the 10% additional for energy community, which is a statutory uh, tax credit, meaning if you qualify for it and you build the system when you are qualified, you then can take advantage of that. And the other major one is the low income community adder, which again is another 10%. However, we don't typically like to get customers uh, too excited about that because it is a, a lottery based uh, structure. And, and the most recent one was 30 times oversubscribed. Um, the other benefits are you 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 fully own the system, uh, and so all the future savings and and the life of the system you 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 reap all the benefits of. Some of the risks or considerations is is this initial capital outlay. So you uh, it does require an upfront investment, uh, may tie up capital that you could be using elsewhere in the business. You do have to 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 see where this fits within your other capital investments. And the other thing is from a responsibility perspective, um, you are responsibility for the planning, the development, the operations and maintenance. Now, I will say that there are plenty of uh, service providers out there that you can hire to take care of operations and maintenance. So we have many customers that we, we talk to that say, 
I don't want to be an, an energy system operating expert. We don't have those capabilities internally, but we do want to own the system and we want to self-finance off our own balance sheet. Great. We can we can help facilitate getting uh, an operations and maintenance provider that will step in uh, to help do that for you. The next major structure within still owning the system is debt financing. And this is financing through loans um, and really spreading that cost over time rather than a lump uh, upfront investment. And these loans can be either secured like PACE, which I'll touch on, uh, and or unsecured. And so in secured loans, uh, PACE is property assessed capital expenditures or property assessed clean energy. So first and foremost, this does put a uh, a lien on the property. It's a it's a special tax lien on the property. Um, it typically requires special approval or or written approval from uh, the mortgage lender, uh, assuming there is a mortgage on the property. But they do typically come with lower interest rates because of this kind of mezzanine uh, debt type structure. And uh, the other thing, and I don't want to spend too much time on this, is this is often most applicable when you're rolling an energy system in with other costs, whether it's a new build or whether you're doing a, a large rehab, say a roof or doing a bunch of big other retrofits on the property. That's really where this um, uh, secured uh, structure comes into play. I'd say more often than not, unsecured loans. So there is no lien on the property. There's uh, often much fewer covenants. Um, but the risks of this uh, unsecured loans are that there are higher higher interest rates, um, especially with the, the the long term nature of these loans due to the increased risk to the lender. Um, some of the benefits of going with a, a, a debt structure is that you, again, retain ownership of the system so you can reap all the benefits of the tax credits, the future savings, other um, other incentives that are available and the flexibility. There's a wide variety of of loan terms, length of terms, and other terms uh, that are that are available out there. Some of the risks would be you've now got this, this debt service that you've got to cover. You've got a liability on your books, and so you're committed to repaying that loan, uh, which does add to your monthly expense, but really you wouldn't be going down this path if those monthly expenses were lower than the, the energy costs that you're offsetting by deploying one of these systems. Um, interest rates on secured loans do typically have higher interest rates, um, which increase the overall cost, and underwriting. You do uh, are required to go through a full underwriting process, typically requires several years worth of financial statements, property documentation, uh, and uh, sometimes that can be challenging if, a if it's a new company or you use special purpose entities for um, some of these, uh, some of these uh, facilities in your portfolio. The last that I'll touch on briefly, um, again, you retain ownership, but uh, a capital lease could be a pathway similar to a loan in the sense that the asset is on your balance sheet and you can take advantage of the tax incentives and and, and other benefits. Uh, uh, but it's a, it's in more of a, a lease structure where you have a consistent monthly payment for accessing the system. Um, and these are uh, often options built into those leases where you can buy the system from uh, uh, the lessor um, at the end of the term. Last thing I'll touch on is uh, one reason that you may want to own the system is to take advantage of, for example, grants. And I'll touch specifically on the USDA uh, REAP grants. And so what those REAP grants are, the REAP stands for Rural Energy for America Program, and it provides between 25 to 50% of a project's costs up to $1 million, um, but the system must be owned by a qualifying small business. And therefore, a developer, which you're going to touch on here shortly, Gareth, that is owning dozens or hundreds of systems, typically uh, isn't going to qualify to receive that grant. And so that's another area. It may it, these these can be pretty significant if you if you have a a two million dollar system and you qualify for a million dollars of offsetting. That's outside of the tax credits that come with it. So. This can really offset uh, substantially the, the cost of a system. And again, the Vecta platform can help identify which facilities are fall into eligible zones and then go down the path of determining whether or not you, you qualify as one of those small businesses. Um, so that's a, a, a hopefully a, a relatively quick summary of the different structures when you want to retain ownership and retain all the benefits of these systems. Gareth, why would someone want to go the other path where someone else owns the system and uh, and and they're reaping those, but but there are some benefits for us as the as the the energy user. Yeah, I love that overview, Dan. I think um, a lot of 
awesome info there and uh, super important for people to be aware of the pros and cons of these. I think for those that want to um, not own the system, there's two primary options. There's energy as a service or referred to as power purchase agreements. Now, those terms are quite interchangeable. There's slight differences. We won't get into that now, but um, essentially um, that's the first one. And the second is an operating lease. So let's cover energy as a service first. Energy as a service really allows us to benefit from the energy system being deployed without us having to own it. So we don't have to think about financing it. We don't have to think about operating it, maintaining it. The third party who comes in, they design it, finance it, build it, own it, operate it, and ensure that you get the energy that you've been promised at an agreed fee, and you simply pay for the energy you use. So huge, um, hugely less complex for us as the, as the buyer. So there's no upfront costs. So we don't need any capital outlay. So this is the classic zero money down opportunity. Um, the service provider, the developer, they cover all of the costs necessary. We, we as the energy consumer, the business, the company with the facility, we're essentially trading one utility bill for another. So instead of paying our utility for energy, we now have a contract with our energy as a service developer. And that energy bill is typically less than what we paid the utility and with little to no escalation, which is agreed as part of our contracting terms. This is super important, especially in the way that we introduce the, the episode around managing inflation and escalating and runaway costs. This is a really nice risk hedging strategy whereby you know, we've got zero money invested, zero capital. We know exactly what our energy bill is going to cost every month for the next 10 to 25 years. It's predictable and we know exactly what the escalation factor will be. That could be zero escalation in some cases, and it could be a couple of percent, but we know exactly from a finan financing perspective what to expect, which is awesome for planning and managing our businesses. The investor is also responsible for all of the installation and O&M, which is operations and maintenance, which is awesome. So they're responsible for performance guarantees, the warranties, and ensuring that we get the energy that we've been promised. If there's any issues with that, the developer has to come out and deal with that. So we don't have to worry about any of the operational challenges. And then lastly, it's great for companies that really don't want to uh, deal with any of the complexities of ownership. It gives us that flexibility where it's someone else's problem, essentially. There are a few drawbacks that you'd want to consider. You know, Because we don't own the asset, we haven't directly invested in it, so we won't reap the benefits of the tax credits and any future financial benefits of the system. So maybe we're planning on utility rates escalating at 5% a year in terms of the financial model, uh, but suddenly they're escalating at 10, 20, 30%, and there's an increasing offset. All of those benefits are captured by the developer. They can play the market and monetize the asset as they see fit. Um, so we don't get to utilize those benefits. We just get that predictable, known, agreed energy cost. Um, and secondly, these are long-term contracts. And so um, depending on your business risk profile, you have to be comfortable locking into an agreement for the next 10 to 25 years. Some businesses really love that because they now can hedge those energy costs as we talked about in the benefits for the long term. And you've got long-term planning uh, foresight. Other people get nervous about contracts that exceed the 10, 15 year mark, and they want to make sure that they are considering the, the concerns around that. As we, as we talked about in our episode around taking our projects to market, it's really important in this construct to ensure that when we go to market and get quotes, that we have the developers talk about what happens if we want to exit a contract early, what happens at the end of the contract life, who owns the asset, and the, the term of the contract itself. So if we don't want to go down the energy as a service or the power purchase route, um, we can also consider operating leases. So these are really similar to power purchase agreements and energy as a service contracts in that the energy system is not recorded as an asset on our balance sheet, and rather it's considered as an operating expense. The biggest difference is, is that we pay a fixed monthly lease fee to access the energy system, regardless of how much energy it produces, rather than under the energy as a service construct, we pay per kilowatt hour 
an, an agreed price. So we know exactly how much energy we need, how much we're going to get, and we've agreed a price for that. Dan, a lot to consume there. Do you want to give us some closing thoughts? Yeah, that's pretty, pretty, pretty heady episode, but I think it's such a, such an important piece. I think to, to bring us home, the really, I'll borrow words from a recent guest we had, Josh Bachman from Cascade Energy and, and expand on his quote. He, he said, this is not a, this is not a technology challenge. It's not a people challenge. I'd add to that and say, this is not a, this is not a capital challenge either. Um, it's really about uh, rallying the stakeholders within the organization to take action and, and gain the benefits of these energy systems. There is so much capital sitting on the sidelines, just waiting to invest in these types of projects because there are guaranteed long-term financial benefits. And when the system is designed and developed correctly, um, both the, the, the financier, if you're not financing off your own balance sheet, or in the in the case of a of an energy as a service or power purchase agreement, they're happy to deploy that capital because of of the long term consistent revenue that they can get. Um, at Vecta alone, within the Vecta marketplace, we have over three billion dollars of capital sitting, waiting, looking to invest in these types of projects, uh, whether they're. Uh, uh, on-site solar or or broader hybrid on-site systems or microgrid projects. So really, as as business leaders, we we collectively need to take advantage of this unique moment in time where the capital is readily available. Um, the the incentives and and primarily through the Inflation Reduction Act and other incentives that are out there, um, we're we're being incentivized to deploy these assets uh, that are going to last us the next 20, 25 plus years. Um, and and really the, the the technologies themselves that go into these systems, the photovoltaic panels, the battery energy storage systems, even gas generators and other technologies, the prices continue to come down. Uh, and, and so it's never been more affordable to de deploy these. I'd say in contrast, the utility rates, uh, which we've talked about uh, in, in a variety of other episodes um, due to rising rising energy demands and a, and a variety of other factors are continuing to rise in volatile ways, which makes it difficult for our business to plan. And, and really, when we think about what do we need as, as business leaders to run our business, we need predictable costs and reliable inputs. And on-site energy provides both of these, regardless of the financing structure you choose. Yeah, I love that, Dan. I think in summary, financing our energy projects is a super strategic decision. And it it's got, you know, very positive and trade-off implications for our business. And it's important for us to really understand those benefits and trade-offs and ensure that we're aligning our financial position with our company values, our commercial drivers, and investment strategy. And so loved your summary. There isn't a better time. These systems are amazing when designed and deployed correctly. They offer huge benefits, both economically and from a sustainability um company longevity perspective, a really awesome time in, in history for us to invest. There couldn't be a better moment. So reach out to Dan, myself, or the Vector team if you've got any other questions or if you want any more information about how to finance your system. And if you've got any other pain points or questions on your mind that you want us to cover in future episodes, please hit us up. Cheers, Dan. Sounds good. Thanks, Gary. We receive a lot of questions from business leaders around the world wanting to learn more about the energy transition, what is possible and where to start. So to help you stay informed and up to date on best practices, opportunities, risks and success stories, we created an industry news feed at vector.com forward slash news with all our podcasts, blogs and newsletter. Check it out and connect with Dan, myself and the Vector team to learn more. Cheers and have a good one.